News feed now. Coronavirus facts, not fear, begins now. Good morning. Welcome in into News Feed Now. I am Aaron Nolan. We're all talking about coronavirus. It's something that's on our mind. It seems like each and every day as we are isolated at homes across this country. Whether we're taking walks outside, making those emergency runs to the grocery store, we're wondering when states will get back to normal. We're starting to see some of the states open up right now uh, when it comes to restaurants. I know Tennessee is opening up. Could have decisions coming very soon in other states across the country. But right now, here are the cases in the United States. We've now crossed the million mark as far as cases are concerned with 58,000 deaths. As we look at the hot spot, of course, it has always been and will continue to be New York because of New York City. Very high density population there, 200, uh, 297,000. Then you've got New Jersey with 115,000. Moving west, California at 46,000. Kind of in that third area, Texas, 26,000. Interesting there with the population out of Texas at 26,000 cases. Neighboring Louisiana with 27. Illinois is that other hot spot with 48,000 cases. The U.S. economy is down. America's first quarter GDP fell at a 4.8% rate. This was a first since the first quarter of 14 and the worst drop since the fourth quarter of 08. Major airlines are making changes. United says wearing a mask will not be mandatory for its passengers, but it will be encouraged. American Airlines says it will hand out masks and sanitizing wipes only as supplies allow. American flight attendants will have to wear face masks starting May 1st. JetBlue is also making changes. The virus is posing two major threats to the United States, health and wealth. Some states are taking steps toward reopening. We just talked about that, but some say doing so could cause further spread. Here's John Lawrence. President Trump signs an executive order to keep meat processing plants running during the COVID-19 pandemic that could protect companies from legal problems if workers become ill. That'll solve any liability problems where they had certain liability problems and uh, will be in very good shape. This comes after a number of companies, including Tyson Foods, were considering a major shutdown of facilities. And as the White House expects to see U.S. jobless numbers jump to as high as 20 percent by June. The unemployment rate at that point will be something that's about as high as something that we haven't seen since, you know, the 1930s. While there are rallies calling for the country to reopen. <laughs> Some have concerns about the risk for workers. It's just a little bit alarming to see that kind of an increase in the potential for loss of life and for at least people being very sick in our community. Georgia, one of the states that has started to reopen, is now projected by one model to see its daily tally of COVID-19 deaths nearly double by August. Over the past three days, we have seen the highest number of people coming in related to COVID-19 than we have during the entirety of this pandemic. The U.S. now has more than a million confirmed cases of COVID-19, according to Johns Hopkins University. That's more than twice the amount from April 10th. I'm John Lawrence reporting. Leaders of large food suppliers are sounding the alarm about disruptions within the marketplace. Some companies are considering keeping only 20% of facilities open. Chad Mira out of Arkansas got a unique chance to go inside a Tyson food plant. Here's what he's got. Several questions about my health, some hand sanitizer, a mask, and a temperature check. 98.6. 97.9, that got me through the door. Now, on with the tour alongside Tyson Group President of Poultry, Chad Martin. Some of the comments that we heard were, you're leading in the industry. First stop was the break room, employees cleaning around the clock. The partitions are new. This outdoor tent also new, giving employees more room to spread out when on break. We are doing everything that we know to do and continue to improve upon to prevent any exposure happening within the facility. Next, there is more gear. We wash our hands and head in to see the processing lines. This picture from the CDC shows what they recommend. It says, if feasible, space workers six feet apart in all directions, ideally so that workers aren't facing each other. Compare that to what we saw today. Workers close together and across from each other. Partitions do separate most of them, but as we saw, not all of them. We asked Martin why, but he referred back to all the other mitigation efforts underway. We've continued to con 
in, continuously improve and work in this area to make it the absolute best to protect our team members because we're committed to their health and safety. So what happens when a worker does get sick? If they're identified through our thermal scanner, then they're sent home and they're asked to, to uh, communicate with their local health provider. Martin says they notify all close contacts of a confirmed COVID-19 patient, but not everyone. The CDC website says exposure could occur from contact with contaminated surfaces or objects such as tools, workstations, or break room tables. Given the number of workers sharing workstations and break rooms, we asked if everyone should be notified of a case. We will continue to openly communicate and, and be transparent with our team on this, um, but being able to have each individual data point uh, communicated at that exact point in time is very difficult, just given the nature of the situation that we're in. Tyson won't confirm case numbers at the facility, but Martin said the facility has not had to cut back on production. Let's go to Chad now out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And before Chad, you talk, I want to kind of clear something up. Uh, if you turn over pretty much any packaged meat in really any state across the country, you're going to see Tyson uh, having a footprint just about in every grocery store across the country. So that's why this is important. Chad, there was some cleaning going on. How much cleaning do they do at this particular plant in northwest Arkansas? Oh, well, there's a lot of cleaning uh, from what they told me. Uh, we saw in the break rooms there, they have people in there cleaning around the clock as, you know, different shifts take breaks at different times. But uh, they have several different measures in place to make sure things are staying sanitized. And, and as you mentioned, you know, the, these food products all around the country, uh, we want to reiterate there's been no evidence to show that uh, something like COVID-19 can be transmitted through these food products. So I think that's important to note as well. Uh, and as you saw in that story there, clearly a lot of measures are in place to try and uh, protect the workers as well as the food. How much concern is there uh, in, in a big corporation like this, especially on the heels of a Tyson plant uh, closing, the pork plant closing uh, in the northern part of the country? Sure, there's a lot of concern, obviously. Uh, first and foremost, they wanted to reiterate their main priority is the health and safety of their workers. And uh, they pointed to that other closure in Iowa that Tyson has had as a way to say, like, look, if things uh, get bad, we will shut down a plant. Uh, you know, we will take that production out of the food supply chain uh, for the sake of trying to keep everyone healthy. So that is a big concern for them, but it also is a concern on a larger scale in terms of the supply chain going on because as more plants close around the country, well, there's gonna be less food available for us in the grocery stores. I did talk to Chad Martin there, the group president of poultry, and he said Tyson has been working to kind of redistribute some of their products. Uh, they send a lot of products to restaurants in particularly. Uh, those restaurants are shut down right now, so they're finding ways to send. Instead of sending that product to restaurants, they're finding a way to redirect it into some of the grocery stores. This is a quote from the chairman of the board of Tyson Foods, John Tyson. The food supply chain is breaking. How, were you able to see any of that there uh, in northwest Arkansas, or did it look like a lot of chicken was coming through? Well, there's definitely a lot coming through at the Berry Street plants that they let us see here. We've seen other reports at other facilities where due to high absenteeism, uh, their production has been slowed. So that is a concern that that uh, letter from John Tyson that you mentioned is a reality that uh, Chad Martin, who I interviewed, did touch upon as well. But at the facility we toured in Springdale, Arkansas, they told me that for now production is still at full force. They're churning out about 11, uh, 11 million pounds of wow. chicken every wow. week there. All right, before you go, Chad, I do want to ask you one question uh, about the state of things in Arkansas. It is my home state, and I know the governor there uh, is going to make an announcement on restaurants today. Uh, it's very intriguing to me as we see states around the country starting to open up restaurants. Any idea of what the expectation is of what the governor there in Arkansas will do? You know, I don't want to speculate on that, but we are expecting that announcement coming up about 1.30 today. And I will say his, his tone in his past several daily briefings has been very optimistic. He's been pointing to 
various data points and showing us various charts to uh, to indicate that he is pleased with the direction Arkansas is heading in terms of case numbers. We know he's looking at but we've asked him about this. What criteria is he looking at when he makes a decision to reopen? He said it's more than just the positive number of cases. He's looking at hospitalization rates as well as hospital capacity, then our PPE supply as well. And he says right now he believes the state is in good shape headed toward a reopening. Of course, he doesn't have to make a decision yet. And we are expecting that at 1.30, so there's still a lot to figure out. We'll see what the latest numbers say. Chad, thank you so much. Again, we've talked about it on this program. Tennessee uh, has opened up restaurants uh, in the majority of its counties. In fact, uh, our buddy Josh Breslow just tweeted out that salons are going to be opening up uh, next week. So uh, some things are changing across the, the states, and it will continue to change. President Trump's comments about possibly injecting patients with disinfectants to treat COVID-19 may have been overshadowed, well, rather may have overshadowed his remarks about ultraviolet light, but the treatment of UV light has been studied. Here's Rob Lowe. A2 Bioscience is the Inglewood Biomedical Company we've told you about before. They're the ones using those rapid blood tests for first responders across the metro. Now they're partnering with an LA hospital to see if they can distribute a device smaller than a pencil to blast away COVID-19 cells with UV light. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. Few people may have known what President Donald Trump was referring to last week, but Josh Disbro, the CEO of A2 Bioscience, did. There's knowledge that UVA, really all UV light, kills bacteria and viruses. Disbro's company has a deal with Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles to distribute a medical device called Heal-Lights that, while still under development, could offer a revolutionary approach to treating intubated patients. They've already got the tube down their throat, obviously, delivering, delivering air. Uh, and then this would go down, the catheter would essentially slide down the tube opening. It would emit light, uh, quite very bright. It's a very specific wattage. As this A2 Bioscience video shows, heal light is inserted into the breathing tube of an intubated patient. The UVA light kills a wide variety of viruses and bacteria. Cedar Sinai does not have FDA approval to test their product for clinical use, but it is seeking emergency use authorization. One key will be to prove its device is safe. Unfiltered UV light is dangerous to humans and human cells. By filtering out the dangerous UVC and leaving UVA light, this supposedly becomes safe for human use. There's a lot of hope, and there obviously are a lot of candidates in the pipeline. This may be one that presents a unique option. If the FDA approves a clinical study, and if it shows real promise, A2 Bioscience tells the problem solvers it could start delivering the tiny devices to hospitals within six months. The hope is to save as, as many lives as we possibly can, as quickly as we can. All right, let's go live down to Denver, Colorado, bring in Rob. Rob, this is fascinating stuff that we're hearing here six months away, but the most important thing here as we continue down this pandemic road is the basis of hope. I think exactly right. Uh, again, it's not proven, but there are so many options out there that are being studied by so many different scientists. And if this one ends up being something that works and can be done and distributed within the next six months, exactly, I think people are looking for hope and UVA technology, if it works, would be great. Uh, it's no one suggesting it's a panacea at this point, but it's certainly something that I think a lot of people smarter than me think is worth at least looking into further. Yeah, uh, the good thing for you and I both, there are people smarter than both of us. Uh, but as we look at this, obviously this is going to be something moving forward that, that I think the president is going to be interested in. Uh, six months time frame, if he can get approval, what is that approval process like? It really is all about the FDA, um, and, and you know the first step is doing some clinical studies on humans. They've done it in the lab on mice. It's shown promise, both in terms of being safe and effective. Uh, so then you want to try it. Typically, it's small human trials. It may just be 10 to 20 patients initially, uh, or you know maybe half of them get the UVA treatment, half don't. And you see, you know, how does it work versus a placebo group? Uh, everything is being fast tracked right now if it shows promise. So. That's the key. Can they get it to show promise in a clinical setting? And if it does, then these instruments that are literally the size smaller than a pencil can be mass produced by H2 Bioscience, uh, who's got this exclusive right to distribute the product across the world 
uh, if they can, and they think they can ramp up production and get these enhanced hospitals again within six months uh, in a perfect world if this shows promise and if the FDA uh, agrees. Rob, thank you so much, man. Appreciate you taking the time again, just providing that glimmer of hope as we're trying to get as many people to recover from this thing as possible. While leaders are pouring over data regarding the best time to reopen, scientists are gazing into their microscopes to see what might work to stop the virus. There is a possible treatment from years of work to kill cancer. Here's our friend out of Chicago, Dina Bear. Pretty much as soon as I heard about the coronavirus and it became apparent that it was going to be a serious problem, I immediately started about, you know, what can I do to help? And I tried to find out as much as I could about the virus. Like so many scientists lending their brain power to the fight against COVID-19, University of Louisville professor of medicine, Dr. Paula Bates had an idea and thankfully a drug she had already developed to treat different forms of cancer. What we discovered there was that um, actually by chance we discovered it was able to kill cancer cells without harming healthy cells. And in that case, we, we took it forward all the way through uh, human clinical trials. And, and that's one reason why we're excited about this recent discovery is that this, this drug has already been uh, tested in cancer patients. And what those clinical trials suggested was that this is going to be a very safe treatment. It, they found the doctors who carried out those trials found that the drug had very few uh, severe side effects. The drug is a piece of synthetic DNA called an aptamer. It acts like an antibody by recognizing a protein on the surface of a cell, specifically nucleolin. The drug binds to the protein, protecting the cell from being unlocked and invaded. Turns out that same protein plays a role when it comes to the novel coronavirus. We, we have done those kind of proof of concepts experiments uh, where we look at cells that are infected with the new coronavirus and, and we found that uh, this experimental drug uh, is able to block the infection of those cells by the coronavirus, which in turn we believe blocks kind of numerous kind of stages of the virus uh, getting into the cell and replicating. The experiments were done at U L's biocontainment laboratory, one of only 12 regional and two national labs in the United States where researchers work with infectious agents, including SARS-CoV-2. The main point is the excitement is driven by, by the fact that this is kind of we believe it's going to be safe in humans and that we have shown, albeit only in a petri dish, that, that it has some activity against the virus. Dr. Bates believes the drug delivered via infusion could work two ways, as a therapy in newly infected patients to stop the virus from replicating and in those already severely ill to help reduce viral load. Speed is of the essence and we'll do everything we can to, to make it happen sooner rather than later, uh, as long as we can get you know, that approval from the FTA and, and do everything safely. Let's go now live to Chicago. Dina joins us. Uh, Dina, obviously the first thing that we want to talk about here is a time frame. How quick are we looking for the possibility of this making its way uh, to those who have been infected by COVID-19? Well, they're really hoping that this is going to be fast-tracked. When you think about this concept, treatments are so critical because we don't have a vaccine, and that's going to take into next year. But Dr. Bates and her team hope the FDA will fast-track approval so this cancer drug could possibly be tested in COVID-19 patients within a few months, and that process would normally take years. So I also want to talk about something else in terms of fast-tracking. Um, some big news on the vaccine front. University of Oxford launched a a vaccine trial for 6,000 people this week. And here in the U.S., most trials are with only about 100 or so. But they had a coronavirus vaccine that was tested to make sure it was safe. And that's the phase one of these trials, right? It was safe. So they tweaked it a little bit for this novel coronavirus, and it can move into phase two automatically, which should expedite the process. But when we talk about these expedited processes, it doesn't mean that the vaccine's going to work. That's what the trial is all about. And um, I can tell you, investors are already pouring millions into the manufacturing process, so if it is a go, they can get it to the masses as soon as possible. But when we talk about as soon as possible for treatment options and for vaccines, that is months to maybe a year away, and that is why all of this social distancing is so important. Dina, you have been uh, with us on this program several times. You've been talking about different possibilities in order to beat this thing, to be proactive, to be reactive to the coronavirus. I'm interested where you stand on maybe what's the most hopeful 
uh, I, I guess, item of whether it's medicine, whether it's the fact that science is coming together to beat this thing, where does your hope lie in, in how this has kind of played out on the medical front, on the scientific front? I guess in terms of talking about hope, you first have to talk about what's most challenging about this virus, and that is that it is so confounding to doctors. What they thought it was, how they thought it would affect the body, who they thought it would affect is all incorrect as time goes on. I mean, we're seeing young people in studies over the last several weeks having strokes who had no prior medical problems. And initially when we saw this virus, we said, oh, it's only affecting older people and it's only affecting people with other comorbidities. So that fear is really troubling. This virus is just so confounding. But you're absolutely right. Scientists from around the world are coming together and that is an amazing thing. And in the case of the story that you just aired, cancer doctors saying, wait a second, this virus operates a little bit like cancer in terms of the way it invades a cell. So maybe we could use a drug that's already been tested in mm. people. And that's why we're able to fast track things. And that is a good thing. But jumping on something too quickly is really troublesome. We talk about the hydroxychloroquine and everyone said in the initially, this is what's going to work. And then we find out that it was causing heart problems in patients. So we have to be very careful not to make COVID-19 patients guinea pigs in our effort to really fast track something that may work. It's a painful process and along the way we are the ones that have to do something to try to protect ourselves and our neighbors and our friends and our relatives. I think a lot of us has been wondering Dina why we haven't been able to quote as you say fast track and, and, and even get things faster but the way that you just summed it up I think says it perfect is that we can't make those patients guinea pigs for the scientific process that there are still some things that we have to go through in order to respect those patients and what they're going through and not put them to be quite honest through any more hell and the great news about that is doctors are really being humbled by this. We talked to a pulmonologist who said that initially ventilators were the first choice for patients. And then they started looking and realizing maybe this is not the best option. Maybe we can slow down on this. And so just the way that they are looking at how patients are responding and focusing so intensely, I think that is a good thing for medicine as we move forward, even in this painful time and even as we know there's not going to be a mm. quick fix. That's good stuff. Dina, thanks so much out of Chicago. We appreciate you taking the time. Let's end on a happy note from his front porch. A Michigan man sings God bless America to his neighbors, hoping to comfort anybody who's suffering. Donovan Long has the story. God bless America. It's a tune that underscores David Young's love for his country and his neighbors. God bless America is really a prayer. David's been singing that prayer from his front porch in Otsego for more than a month. I just thought it would be a, a way of, of praying over the neighborhood, of bringing people together. With no music and no choir, he succeeded, using only his baritone voice to bring harmony to his listeners. I love it. When I see that flag, too, that blesses me. It makes me... Whew. Anyway, yeah, I love it. It's a comfort. You know, you hear it and you, and you know that your neighbors are out and, and they're, they're okay. David says he'll keep singing until Governor Whitmer lifts her stay home, stay safe order. I love to uh, inspire people. Until then, God bless. he'll be a familiar voice uh, in an uncertain time. Donovan now joins us live from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Donovan, what a great reminder that man, woman, sick or healthy, mm -hmm. we're all still Americans. That is the truth. I got to tell you, so many of his neighbors, so many of David's neighbors really rally around him in his front porch to join hands in singing that song. And it does remind them that they are united and that they are here for each other, especially during this uncertain time, Aaron. We uh, kind of been talking quite a bit on this program today about hope, about hope of, of vaccines, about, about hope of treatments, about hope of recovery. This just provides us the good old down home hope then maybe the front porch of America can bring us back to. 
That's the truth. I, I think that you hit the nail on the head there. I think that this song is reminiscent of that, and it's 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 it sort of kind of complements that hope and that desire mm -hmm. to just keep moving forward together. Good stuff. Before you go, though, I do want to talk about Michigan, obviously one of the harder hit states uh, in the United mm -hmm. States. Governor Whitmire has made uh, news across the country as she has made different decisions and, and based on the numbers there in Michigan. How are things going right now? And uh, if I if I was checking social media right, the governor did make an announcement today about reopening construction. That's true. She is expected to speak and address the state today uh, at three o'clock here uh, in Michigan. And a lot of people are, as you can imagine, eager to get back to work, eager to resume life as normal. But you know, under her leadership, I think everybody who lives in this state must follow her in terms of making sure that we are doing the necessary measures and taking the, taking the necessary steps to get back to normal as safe as possible. Even if it means singing distancing at the same time, Donovan <laughs> and I have been social media friends for a long time. Good to finally say hello to you here on this website. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Aaron. It's such a pleasure. Good nice to, to see meet you, Donovan. You. Thanks so much, live out of Michigan. That is our show uh, on this Wednesday. We'll be right back here at 1030, giving you facts, not fear, on everything that is the coronavirus. See you tomorrow. Have a great afternoon.